Okay, hello, and welcome to this eCampus News webinar, Defending Your Data, Keys to Protect and Manage Your Institutional, Student, and Research Data. My name is Kevin Hogan. I am the Editor-at-Large for eCampus News, and I'm happy you're joining us today for what I know will be a very insightful and important conversation. This event is brought to you by Commvault. Commvault is a global leader in cloud data protection. Their intelligent data services help your organization do amazing things with your data by transforming how you protect, store, and use it. They provide a simple and unified data protection platform that spans all your data, regardless of whether your legacy or modern workloads live on premises, in the cloud, or spread across a hybrid environment. Commvault solutions are available through any combination of software subscriptions, integrated appliances, partner managed or software as a service via their metallic portfolio. For more than 25 years, more than 100,000 organizations have relied on Commvault to keep their data secure and ready to drive business growth. So before we get to our conversation, I'd like to take a minute to go over some of the features of the platform that we're using. This event is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing it then. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with PDF of the slides. If you have a question or comment for the panelists, please use the chat function that you can launch by clicking on chat. Feel free to use this feature to contact someone from the eCampus news team if you have a technical question. So with these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started with our conversations and some introductions. First, uh, Bill Hunkapiller. Bill leads the Information Security and Privacy Office at Florida State University. The office is made up of a security architecture team, a security operations team, and a risk compliance and privacy team. Their mission is to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of FSU systems and data. Throughout his career, Bill has accumulated over 25 years of IT security, privacy, governance, risk and compliance experience in the private and public sectors. Next, David DeVries. David is the CTO and Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives for Commvault. David is a global leader in data and information management, a former Department of Defense Deputy CIO and State of Michigan CIO. Dave has decades of experience leading and driving strategic innovation and outcomes in complex environments. A retired military officer with deep information technology and executive management experience in commercial industry and government service, he's led many organizations through major change while ensuring mission critical operations. And then Sven Alterman. Sven is a senior cloud solution architect at Microsoft. Previously, he was an IT director and lecturer in information systems. Sven has taught courses in data warehousing and information security and is the co-author of The Art of SQL Server uh, fi File Stream and SQL Server Administration Inside Out. And then last but certainly not least, Melissa Hortman. Melissa is a senior industry executive with Microsoft who leads digital transformation and accelerating academic research across all of U.S. higher education. Previous to Microsoft, she was an associate professor and director of instructional technology at an academic medical center in South Carolina. Melissa is passionate about empowering uh, faculty innovation and student resiliency to make higher education more agile and stronger during disruptions now and in the future. And again, before we get deep into the conversation, I might wanna ask the, uh, the audience to participate in a, in a poll question so our panel can kind of get an idea of where you are uh, when it comes to data and the securing your data and, and how we can hopefully help you, help you over the course of the next hour. So uh, the question is, how would you classify your data governance for your institution right now? And what, are your, uh, what is your area of responsibility? Uh, this is a single choice. I suspect there might be more than a few folks who have one or more of these, but give it, give it your best shot and maybe what is the highest priority. So the first one is uh, we know what data we have responsibility and have established a data plan that covers data classification, retention requirements, and resilient, resiliency requirement. Um, we know what data we have responsibility and are developing 
uh, an inclusive data plan covering what type of data that is, uh, those requirements. Um, we know what data we are responsible for, but we're just beginning that journey of classifying it and managing it holistically. And finally, we know where our data is, but rely on central IT or a service provider to manage it, uh, to meet the compliance and retention requirements. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to kind of go over those and um, pick a, a spot. Uh, where you think that you're more closely aligned and our panelists can kind of have an idea of, of who we're talking to out there. And I'm sure we have, um, well, I'm guessing we'll have a certain number of folks across the spectrum, but this will certainly kind of help us as we, uh, as we dive in. Okay, so we can see those results. Um, it looks like a, a, a small majority over um, what data we have responsibility in developing a, a data plan. Panelists, those all resonate with you to see where, where our folks are and where we can set our level of conversation. I know we can go up and down mm -hmm. uh, at will. So great. So. Uh, Thanks everybody for that. And so uh, let's get going. Uh, but before we kind of get deep into the weeds about, about the data, I know that there are certain levels of conversations that we wanna have. And, and as sick as I am talking about the pandemic, uh, thankfully we are over the pandemic. Um, maybe we'll start off by asking each of the panelists a little bit of how they've seen mm -hmm. data change as a result of the past three years, especially when it comes to institutions of, of higher education. I know that a lot of moves to, uh, you know, the remote learning, that immediate move to remote learning, and now whatever level of hybrid sort of setups changed a lot of information architectures and changed the level of data protection and the necessary needs to protect data. Um, Sven, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, talk a little bit about where the state of play is in data right now as, as we come out of, you know, the past three years. Yeah, Kevin, thanks uh, for that. So first of all, I think we probably should have mentioned to the attendees responding to the poll that there wasn't a right answer. And I don't know if they were hoping that there was a right <laughs> or a wrong answer to give. Uh, I think most people probably realized that the first choice would have been the one that puts them in the best position, you know, to manage that data going forward. But I think, you know, the poll results clearly showed that um, most people, most institutions, I should say, still have quite a bit of work to do. And, uh, and that's what hopefully we're, we're here to, to help out a little bit with that. So, so having said that, um, I think that the, the pandemic has probably shown us or has accelerated some of the need to facilitate access to data, regardless of where, where people are, right? You mentioned the remote learning, Kevin, you mentioned uh, remote work. You know, from, from my perspective, uh, we have seen that um, uh, customer requests coming in uh, very often, very fast uh, for how can I give people access to uh, to this data when they are not on campus, when they're not in, in a cubicle or, or in, in a research uh, facility. Um, I also probably uh, want to think about the pandemic by itself may not have brought this on so much. I think this was an evolution that has been going on for a while, but it contributed somewhat to the need to also make data available in a collaborative scenarios, right? Across institutions, for example. Um, I'm, I'm especially thinking research data then, you know, that doesn't really apply so much to student institutions, uh, uh, student data and so on. But when it comes to research data, that has certainly uh, been something that, like I said, has probably started well before the pandemic. Um, but, you know, throughout the pandemic, uh, collaborative uh, research on, for example, medical data, uh, that was directly related to the COVID uh, outbreak, you know, was very valuable. And a lot of research institutions that I have worked with have had projects going on across their own borders, uh, collaborating with a lot of institutions. Yeah. And Bill, maybe you could talk about, you know, kind of feet on the ground there at FSU and about how uh, you see the, the importance of data become accelerated during these, you know, during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... You know, I think, you know, before the pandemic, we were more concerned about protecting our assets, you know, whether we were in the cloud or on premise, kind of 
kind of as a wall or a castle, but now people are working remote, they're studying remote, they're um, in different locations. And my concern is, you know, what, what are they logging into FSU systems on? Is it a student worker who's doing a research project with confidential data? They go home to visit their grandma, they log on to a Windows 95 machine that's already compromised and it's got key loggers on it and malware. You know, those are the concerns that I have. And, um, and, it, and there's certain things that we can do to, to help with that, but, it, you know, it's no longer just kind of this castle wall uh, situation. It's people distributed all over the world accessing your data, and should they be able to download certain types of data? Should they not be able to? Um, and then if, if they do, how do you protect that? Um, so, I mean, it's it's just changed from kind of more of an on-prem world to all over the place. And certainly, Sven was talking about research. You know, we're building research enclaves um, actually with Microsoft and uh, and also with some some other groups. But it's, um, you know, the data is on-prem, the data is in the cloud, and you've got people all over uh, FSU and our partners accessing it, and it has to be done securely. So it's kind of a different world. Yeah. How does that resonate, David, with uh, with your experiences? So I think that that's all very, very accurate. And, and but what's also happening, and, and as Sven said, it probably speeded up more during the past three years during the pandemic, is a focus toward risk management, not ultimate uh, exact science on security. Uh, you know, four or five years ago, it was if you buy this, you buy that tool and so forth, you can lock the, the, the doors or permit only those to come, come through there that have the right keys in their hands. And now it's more or less moving away from the systems approach and more toward the data side. How do I protect the data? Well, for me to protect something, I need to know where it is. And so that alone has been a real learning curve for a lot of the universities out there is just coming to grips with where is the data really stored at? Because in the past, if the researcher got the grant and they bought a server of approximate size and they plugged it in and ran it underneath their uh, desk with the graduate students helping them, that was where their data was. Now suddenly, you know, the, the universities as a whole are taking the whole risk management side and security side uh, very much to heart. And two, how do I share it? I just as Bill talked about and share it re reliably there. Right, right. And Melissa, I'll, I'll, I'll tap, your, uh, tap your thoughts on the, on the initial topic here. So uh, just kind of having conversations with uh, a lot of different uh, institutions across the US lately about transformation. Um, I think higher education has talked about transformation for a long time, um, decades maybe. And uh, it's, uh, I think over the past three years, uh, it's really shown that it's not just something that we have to talk about anymore, we have to maybe do. Um, transformation in a lot of different ways, uh, the business of higher education, everything, but um, a lot of conversations around just breaking down silos, research, mm -hmm. you know, research data over here and uh, student data over here, but uh, even within colleges, within an institution and breaking down those silos and bringing the data together in a safe and secure way so that it can actually be leveraged um, to even solve complex issues uh, and solve questions that uh, we're really trying to shift uh, for, for higher education. You know, they're not just thinking about student success anymore, they're thinking about student persistence. So how do we leverage the data within an institution to do that? So I think institutional data is really, um, it's a really interesting area right now because I think it's kind of, um, you have to do something about it, right? And I think there's a lot of pressure to do something about it now. And, and so how do we do that again in a safe and secure way? Yeah, and David, and to David and Melissa's point, um, there's a lot to consider before you even get into the kind of the technology aspects of, of all these things, right? I mean, David, you talked about the idea of risk management and the, 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 that concept of risk management. And Melissa, you're just mentioning that you're breaking down silos and bringing in a team. I mean, it's almost like when it comes to risk management, you need to bring in a whole aspect of uh, various stakeholders, right? David, I'll throw that one at you first. Well, it, that's very much true. I mean, the, the total risk management perspective is a team sport. It is not just one 
assignment that you give to a certain group of people and say, manage the, the risks on this and tell me what you come up with, uh, fill out your spreadsheets and so forth, and just give me a, uh, a roadmap for it. It is a, a continuous dialogue because things are constantly changing from what data you have, who is, has access to it, who needs access to it, where is that data stored at, what kind of clouds, uh, because there's pressures on these institutions to continually evolve due to grants that come in, grants that expire, uh, the need to share it across other uh, universities, as Melissa pointed out there. And then two, how do I do all that stuff as technology continues to change every single day? Uh, yeah, Bill, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Melissa, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna add, I think that team sport is a really important piece of this that everyone needs a seat at the table. Um, data management, data security, all of those things isn't owned by a single entity anymore. Um, we're all responsible for that, which is again, very different for higher education um, because you could just put you know, your research data on a thumb drive and mail it in a manila envelope across campus and it's different now. And so we're all responsible, no matter what our role is um, from faculty to staff, to administrators, to IT, we all need to be at the table early and often for those conversations, because it really is about um, having a, a mutual understanding and mutual respect for each other. Um, one of the most important people uh, at my last institution was uh, the security office for me. And I was a faculty member and I felt that <laughs> they were my best friend. <clears throat> they taught me so much. They helped me actually understand the need for my role to really understand data. And I think that that's really what's helped me um, see it as a whole picture versus, you know, just uh, you're, you over there can get that, right? Right, right. Bill, how are your silos? <laughs> I mean, well, it, you know, it, it's interesting when, you, you know, a seat at the table, um, we have a new, well, relatively new enterprise risk management committee that our that our president started, and I sit on that committee, and it's and it's great to be able to talk about these risks, you know, um, the likelihood of occurring, the impact if it would happen, and the, and the university has to make a business decision on those risks, right? It's not me who makes that decision, um, and it shouldn't be someone who's, um, you know, a faculty member or a researcher or a administrator that accepts a risk that could impact the entire university. Like I'm making the decision to, to put all this confidential data on a public website where anybody can see it. Obviously that's something that they that they can't do, um, but it's a business decision. So my job is to, you know, to identify that risk, bring it to the university, and then we make a decision. And so if there's a risk, um, uh, you know, say we have a data center that doesn't have a, a generator, that's not the case, but if you had that and the university said, well, yeah, we've got UPSs, they'll shut the machines down after 10 minutes and there's nothing critical on there. It does, it's not a mission critical system. Okay, cool, great. But when we lose power and those systems get shut off, that's that's what we accepted and that's what would occur. Um, but, but that's what's important is being able to bring those things up and getting a decision made so that's either within or, or outside of the, the risk tolerance of the institution and then you need to do something about it to bring it within that risk tolerance. And, and we've had that, uh, I've been invited to that, I've spoken at that uh, committee, and, it, and it's very encouraging to see it. And I think part of that is with like GLBA, the Graham Leach Bliley Act, the, the qualified individual, the CISO, from the security standpoint has to report to the board. The FTC is requiring that now for public universities because we see over and over and over all these events occurring in higher education, in, you know, uh, private industry and, and and in the government. I mean, we saw something about one of the FBI uh, sites got hit the other day, and it's it's uh, it's serious business, and it's and it's not just the CISO who's responsible for it, right? Um, and and so for me, it's always been, hey, I want them to know what that risk is and make a decision as to whether it's acceptable or not, partially because it's a CYA for me. But it's also, it's a business decision and that business decision has to be made and I can't make it always, right? It's not appropriate for the CISO or for IT to say, yeah, we don't need backups. Yeah, that's not important. Nah, we don't need a, you know, a generator on our data center. That's not important. We don't need to encrypt anything. Why would we do that? Yeah. You know, those, those are decisions that can't be made uh, within IT. That's a, that's a business decision. So anyway. 
Yeah, Sven, does uh, Bill's experience resonate with, with what you've, you've been seeing? Definitely. <clears throat> I was going to, as, as Bill was explaining that, I was definitely thinking back to recent conversations I've had with a few customers. I think most recently, what our customers have been experiencing, especially those with medical research data, they have been facing um, the Center for uh, Medicaid and Medicare Services uh, new regulation to have an SAQ, a self-attestation questionnaire, uh, to be completed before they can um, use that data. And so they need to attest, uh, you know, that they have certain protections, certain controls in place, that the data will be handled in accordance with, uh, you know, the agreement that was reached for the use of the data. And <clears throat> that is something, uh, as Bill was saying, not just one person is going to sign off on that. I've actually heard literally a customer in the last week say, someone in the IT security office say, I am not signing off on this. The researcher needs to sign off on this. Um, you know, because there are too many things on there that a researcher needs to do. So it's definitely having this this seat at the table. You know, the table is is growing. I think, <laughs> um, you know, there are more chairs around the table. Uh, more people need to be there, and I think they all need to understand the significance of what it is that they're dealing with. Right? What the impact is going to be if something goes wrong. Um, and then, like like Bill mentioned, make a business decision as to what is the most effective and appropriate way uh, to implement controls, to educate people, you know, to monitor what is going on in the environment. You know? <clears throat> and and you know, in, in the end, it all goes back to the data. Um, when I uh, uh, fairly recently took a, a training course uh, that dealt with with CMMC, which is also not a big topic. Um, certainly in uh, uh, for, for anyone dealing with Department of Defense data now, um, the, the trainer said, you know, follow the data, right? That, that, is, that is what matters. You follow the data. So, David, I see you were trying to chime in. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so, the, so the, uh, the whole thing behind the data side is just that. It's where is this being stored at? How do I protect it? And what's changing today is in the past, Decisions were elevated up to the board of governors or the regents based upon what? How much money that particular college or that particular entity was bringing into the college. So the more money you brought in, the more prestige you had, the more voice you had in certain things. And Bill, you might have some anecdotes too, but I'm seeing it now shift to more of look at the data and the implications of what happens if that data gets out or it's not shared to the institution as a whole. So now other voices have a stake in this thing and that's where they need to have those discussions about. And we're seeing some of those universities just jump on that and have those changing board processes, if you will, or the uh, governorship uh, and, then, and then taking action on it because it's no longer a committee with the power of no, it should be the committee with the power of yes. How do I move this university forward? How do I, how do I keep sharing this data, protecting the data, sharing the data uh, in, in a very changing world because the threat actors are changing every day. Um, and so is the other technologies and, and that kind of stuff, so. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we've seen, um, you know, as, as researchers are applying for grants before the award comes in, they want a, an, an attestation from the CISO that things are quote secure, mm -hmm. which, you know, there's no such thing, right? I mean, I can talk about the controls and, uh, and compliance, but there's, you know, secure is, is a pendulum, right? I mean, it's a, so, but we're seeing that we're seeing uh, grant uh, agencies scanning, doing third party scans of our environment and saying, hey, we're, we're concerned about some risky areas. We're concerned about, you know, giving data to somebody who's not at this level. So it's, for me, it's, you know, security is a competitive advantage. And so the better security that we have as a university, you know, when somebody goes to present a grant, it's, hey, we, we've got a third party risk score of this. Our competitors are down here. Do you care about the security of your data? Because if so, you know, it, it's a it's a competition, in my opinion. Um, but uh, we're, we're seeing more and more of those attestations, uh, forms to be completed for grants. Our cyber liability insurer wants more and more controls and mm -hmm. technology to to maintain that insurance. And it's because they don't want you to get breached because they got to pay out. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely changing. Um, I kind of feel like, you know, when, when you go home for the holidays, there was always the, the adults table, you know, where all the big people sat and then the kids were all over here. And it seems like security went from, you know, the kids table to, to, to up at the big table with, with the turkey and the dressing and everything. And it's, 
um, it's it's good to see that. It's good to see that. Well, certainly when you see the news reports about the constant barrage of attacks that are occurring, and not you know not only at uh, major institutions, but just really you can go all the way down to K twelve in school districts. It's uh, it, it's a hugely important issue. Mm-hmm. So now looking back at our our, our 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 poll questions and where people are in the journey, I think it might be appropriate to kind of maybe start a little bit at the at the beginning and talk a little bit about the basics for what each of you think of when you think of uh, the basics of cybersecurity. Um, maybe Melissa, we'll, we'll, we'll talk with you uh, about where you can see that, that, that primer for some of those folks who are just at the, the first steps. You probably shouldn't start with me because I'm one of the end users. I'm one of the people that Bill's like, don't do that. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting kind of coming from uh, the other side of things and um, kind of seeing this from a non-technical role of how do, you know, how does cybersecurity affect me um, in my role in digital transformation, in my role as a researcher, as in my role as a faculty member. And it, it's interesting being on the other side because I don't get purview into um, uh, why, why, why do we have to do all these things, you know? And why do you have to spend all this money here? You know, we could use it over here in the institution. And so I think, you know, back to Bill's point, uh, or, yeah, I think there's, there's so much infrastructure and support and pieces that have to go into place first so it's just this foundation of uh, people, support, training, um, all the pieces so that the end user, the, the me's at the institution can do their job, can do their job effectively, can, can actually ask the complex questions and get answers, can find um, insights into the data and not just have data, um, can use the data um, in a lot of different ways for my research and share it with the community and actually push forward open science, you know, all the things that we want to do as the end user, um, we need the bills of the world (laughs) who who really do dig their heels in and build this strong foundation. And so I, my, my recommendation would be if you're on this side, on the end user side, have patience. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is have patience as these Uh, changing technologies and changing um, federal regulations and all the things um, are going into place so that security offices can really make sure that you can do your job effectively. And once an institution is in sync like that, I think there's no stopping it. So it's just, uh, that would be my biggest recommendation. Have patience. (laughs) And I mean, it's true because security and convenience don't go hand in hand, right? I mean, (laughs) You know, we, you know, we have to do multi-factor authentication. You know, we're told to use different passwords for different websites. And, and that makes it hard, I mean, to, to remember all of that and follow all that. But, but Melissa's right. I mean, we can have all the technology in the world, but when, um, when someone is fished, when someone has been attacked from a social engineering and that data is exfiltrated, and that happens. And it's because people want to be trusting. People want to help, you know. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a technology problem. It's a people problem. It's a bad actor problem, but it, you know, you want to protect things. I mean, there's a cost to security. There's a cost to compliance and you don't want to overprotect things if, in, unless you really have to, right? I mean, it's, uh, but at the same time, you want to protect things appropriately. I've heard people say, well, Hey, you know, all my data is public, so I don't care. It doesn't need to be secure. It's like, well, what if somebody goes and manipulates your data? You didn't know it, and all these research articles you published are now null and void because they changed all your data. Um, so it's, but you're right. It's it's um, not everybody likes uh, the the security people, and um, it's just it's the nature of the beast. But it's a fantastic job. I absolutely love it. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Yes, Fred, it does it, it does seem that um, you know behavior uh, and the, the management of users' behavior is as important when it comes to these security things as the, the technology itself, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to a buddy of mine who's, who's, whose dad is just about to turn 90, and he's getting text calls every day, you, this check bounced, uh, you know, we need gift cards, you know, your social security check is bounced or whatever, you know, and it's, 
people are susceptible to that. I mean, all the way from, you know, my 15 year old son gets the same sort of spam messages, texts and emails. And, you know, it's, if it's too good to be true. Right. <laughs> it usually is. Yeah. But then that's so Sven, I mean, so you have that user side of things, but now the other responsibility is uh, probably on, on the flip. When you, when you think about the various compliance regulations that institutions have to, mm -hmm. uh, to follow through, right. I mean, which are, are meant to help protect, but again, they can be uh, they can be a sticky wicket themselves too, right? Yeah, they, they certainly can be. And you know, we started or, or or sometime earlier in the conversation, we talked about risk management, and that's really what it boils back down to, right? As part of the risk management approach, you're going to determine, as Bill was saying, you know, the data is public. When we think about security, and I'm going to sound like a cybersecurity 101 instructor here, but you know, you've got confidentiality which is what most people think about when we think about data security, but there's also the integrity aspect and the availability aspect, right? There's a CIA triangle or triad there of security, you know, and that researcher that might be telling the CISO at their institution, all this data is public, this doesn't need to be protected. You know, Bill gave a great example of, uh, you know, what if the data gets manipulated and you're unaware of it. I'm also thinking of what if you have a contractual deadline to meet to produce research results and the data is unavailable because it was stored, you know, inappropriately. Um, there, there, there were no appropriate backups or the, you know, the things that we've all heard before, right, uh, about data availability. So all of those things are very important. And actually, as it turns out, you know, a lot of the regulations that we're dealing with aren't just talking about the confidentiality and the privacy of data. They are talking about the availability of data. You know, certainly HIPAA, for example, has a significant um uh, portion in there about the data needs to be available and the integrity needs to be um guaranteed as well but from a from a business perspective i don't know if you could say that confidentiality is more important than integrity or availability they all are going to have a significant impact is if one of them is lost you know david i I'm sure with your wide range of of experience you've seen some of those things before as well um so maybe I, i'm interested to see what your thought on that is <laughs> So that's very true. And, and what you just kind of talked about going from the risk management side of the house to the various tools out there, it's not about how many tools can I buy? When is my budget going to exhaust itself and I can no longer buy more tools? So therefore, I'm going to be at this point. It is about how do you manage your data with the appropriate set of tools that will be continually evolving uh, as you look, as, as you learn more about your environment there. You know, one of the things that we did, I was one of the, the founding uh, fathers of this thing called Federal Ramp or FedRAMP, which is the certification process under the, the NIST. And it was for that government data. Well, guess what? Some of that same stuff now is happening down at the state level. And it's also happening down at the higher education stuff because they've realized we have got to follow what I would call the left and right guidance because that's about right for the minimum security thing. And so a lot of the universities, subscribe to that uh, process called HECBAT. Um, and we, the vendors, have to uh, analyze our stuff and we have to self-assess to them and then they can go back and, and score us on it. And that's all the right stuff because that's helping us all work together on managing the risks that are continually out there for us. Yeah, and we use the HECBAT and also uh, a SOC2 report from, from yep. vendors from a third-party risk management standpoint. And, uh, and it's... You know, it's very helpful. I, I prefer the SOC 2 or, or another independent security audit, but but if they don't have it, here's the heck back. And, and you can get some really good information and, and, and start identifying where risk is within your third parties um, as well. So I was, I was listening to somebody the other day um, on a webinar or something, and they were talking about their, they were a, a supply chain issue with cardboard boxes. And this company was, you know, needed to ship their material, but they couldn't find any boxes. And it, those are the sorts of things. I mean, that has really nothing to do with data, but basically you just shut down the company and made it very difficult for them to do anything. I mean, I guess they went behind liquor stores and got, you know, boxes and tried to <laughs> ship things as best they could, but it's, you know, third party risk can't be, you know, uh, dismissed either, so. Mm -hmm. and, and what's phenomenal out there is that, so we have some larger corporations here represented on this thing here, but there's a lot of companies that we all work with that are smaller, more of a niche type thing that go to the universities to help sell them a, a critical capability there. They need the help too. And that's where all these uh, standards and certifications come mm -hmm. into play. So that even if they help resell our stuff, 
they know that they can stand up to Bill and say, I know that this stuff is, is certified and it's safe to use and so forth. Yeah. Because we're all on this thing together. Yeah, you bet. I, I found it very interesting that, that uh, you know, Bill was saying that, well, uh, I'd like to see a SOC 2, you know, at the station, but, you know, we'll take a hack fat if we need to. The, the big difference there, you know, is how much does it take for that vendor to present that SOC 2 versus that hack fat? You know, I can complete an Excel spreadsheet, uh, you know, quite quickly, but uh, if I, as a vendor, am required to go to SOC 2 at the station, it goes back to, you know, maybe security has a competitive advantage, but it also goes back to meeting some of these requirements. There's there's some work involved. There's effort. There's there's cost. You know there's personnel. You know you need to have the right the right people with the right skills to to manage that as a as a vendor. And uh, th those things are, are are definitely coming to the forefront um, in a lot of a lot of cases. Way more than than we just had a few years ago. Yeah, and even if you've got a SOC two that doesn't have any qualifications or your HVAC is good, you still could have an incident, right? We see we see that all over the place. So it's it provides some assurance, but it doesn't mean that you know that you're you're not going to have something because you can't eliminate that risk. So, um, as I say, you've at least met the basics. Yeah, you're safe for the road, so to speak. Now, how you drive that car may still be a whole different question, but that's right. This this part that you're not going to put on your uh, network and so forth, it is safe for the road, and this is how that cloud provider or that vendor put it together and how they're operating it. And you know, to us at the vendor side of the house, it's really fascinating because. Those SOC 2s, it's an internal audit of our people, our processes, and how we made this stuff. And so it is out there. And so here within Convo, and I think that's true within most companies, once we get our SOC 2, we provide that to the customer upon ask, but we make them sign up on non-disclosure things. Because why? Because I'm bearing my soul to you on what our product was doing and what our processes are. And we expect that to be uh, protected. Mm -hmm. But it comes back to trust, but verify and be on the same team. Yeah, it's like when someone asks for a copy of your penetration test report, it's like, no. We don't get that out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thanks for playing. Yeah. Well, David, I'll, I'll take your, your analogy with the car and uh, ask about another aspect of this whole risk management strategy is that idea of cyber liability insurance. Uh, anybody on the panel want to talk a little bit about uh, why that is necessary in today's uh, higher education data security landscape? Well, well, before coming to FSU, I worked in the insurance and reinsurance space for about 11 years. Um, and we have cyber liability insurance and we have it for a number of reasons. And I think a lot of people say, well, it's just to pay to the ransom. And that's not what the insurance is for. It's for incident response, it's for credit monitoring, it's for call centers of people that have been impacted, regulatory fines, uh, legal defense. Um, and it's uh, it covers a whole bunch of things that are outside of just what the actual incident cost is. Um, and, and it's, you know, I was looking at something the other day um, that the, the actual cost of an incident is eight to 10 times more than what the the ransom would have been because you you're still going to lose data you're still going to have issues so you know it's interesting because we've seen just an increase in the premium an increase in the retention or the deductible over the past several years but it seems to be starting to stabilize a little bit because these insurance companies are pushing requirements on mm -hmm. on organizations saying hey if you don't have this if you don't have multi-factor authentication, if you don't have a privilege access management system, if you don't have an immutable backup, if you don't have enterprise encryption, if you don't have endpoint detection and response, you're too risky. We think you're too risky to insure and you're, you're uninsurable. Um, and so we even have grants that require it. We have contracts that require it. And so some of it's, well, we'll just be self-insured. That's not as easy as just saying, I'm gonna be self-insured and I'm gonna put you know, $10 million in the bank to respond to something because that's not going to do it. Um, but it, it's it's fascinating because it's uh, the, the insurance companies were losing their shirts at the beginning of it. And I think it's starting to stabilize, but it's because they were requiring us to to buy and implement more technologies, more controls to, to protect the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a, a whole lot of personal experience with cyber liability insurance, but one thing I do know about insurance companies having done some consulting work in a, I guess it was a prior life <laughs> uh, for insurance companies was 
that uh, they, they're, they're pretty good at assessing risk and they're pretty good at doing the math. And, and I really think that, you know, when Bill is saying the cyber uh, liability insurance companies are now requiring you to demonstrate, you know, and implement certain techniques, that means one thing. It means that those techniques are effective, right? Um, you know, and they've done, the insurance companies have done the math. And uh, I think that's that's certainly something that that I think uh, can be eye opening uh, for for some institutions. You know, if their insurance company says we need to have this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these controls implemented. You know, we need to we need to have our users educated. All these kinds of things. It's because it really works and it makes a difference. Yeah, and it's it's new and it's changing so much. It's not like life insurance or or, or driver's mm -hmm. insurance, your auto insurance. They don't have you know, decades and, and years of research, it's it's pretty new, it's pretty common, uh, or pretty new. And so they, they don't have all that data to, to really uh, uh, to, to have a, a solid analysis that, hey, if you have this, you're good. Um, so there's a bit of an art to that, to that underwriting science there, you know? Right, right. Uh, let me just take a break here um, really briefly and, and remind the audience, if you have a question, or you have an idea, or you ha have a an opinion that you want to share here with the panel, uh, please feel free to enter it into the, the Q&A portion or the chat function. Either or will get to us and we'll make sure that our, our panelists uh, can answer that. Maybe at this time, maybe we can kind of move a little bit from the idea of these insights to uh, action when it comes to when we're talking about data and where it is spread across your campus and maybe look at different ways in which you can classify the data. And maybe, uh, David, we'll, we'll start with you, maybe, if you can kind of set the table for us when we're talking about uh, what it comes to the value of data. Sure. And I'll go back to some of my original comments here where we're moving away from systems that created the data that were certified to collect the data in the first place, authorized by the university or by the state laws or by the federal laws to collect that type of data, and then for what purposes it could be used for to more of know the data, where is it at and so forth. Some of those other restrictions are still there. Why did you collect the data? What authority did you have to collect it? And then what are you gonna do with it? But as we're going into more of the data action, so to speak is now that I know where it is, it's no longer because this grant and this group of researchers here got the money and the need to collect this data. Therefore, I'm gonna let them store it in their own little uh, either logical sands or their own cloud or their own desktop computer underneath their desk. I'm going to now take that and put it more at the enterprise because then I can put my, my enterprise tools around that, but also allow them to help me help them manage that data. So you're seeing more and more of that, and that will also help reduce some of the risks for uh, threat and so forth, that, that as you sit down and talk to those insurance folks, you can help drive down your costs. And that's where we're getting involved more and more now with these higher level education institutions is how can we help reduce our risks and therefore reduce the cost of our cybersecurity insurance? Hmm. And, Any I, of the other, and I think the other, from ahead. my past background, you know, you know I'll, I'll let uh, Sven and, and uh, Bill talk to some of this too. When you get a grant from the federal, especially, it doesn't just come with m m money, it comes with requirements. Mm -hmm. Know what the data is. Here's what you collect. Here's how you got to protect it. So we've also had it in the federal space for many years, but it is getting it's beginning to get more teeth in now, and that is the controlled, unclassified information. So it's not just any information out there. It is now this information that they deem is sufficiently critical enough to protect it, control who has access to it, and how do you put it up? Which is now causing the IT departments, um, the universities as a whole and even the specific colleges to look at that and say, hmm, we got to take a whole new approach on data there. I'll let Sven and, and Bill talk to some of that now. Yeah, ab absolutely, David. The, you know, emergence of, of the CMMC program uh, for, for anything practically related to, to grants that the DOD issues to, to research institutions um, has created a significant demand for, um, you know, the the institution as a whole to get more involved, right? To get uh, to get the CISOs involved in what's uh, what does this grant mean, you know, for the institution, uh, and then the researcher, you know, having to think way harder about 
how am I going to, you know, make sure that access to this data is appropriately controlled, that, that it's all at the, you know, the, there's way, you know, way too much in CMMC to, to go over here. And that's not really the point of this, of this webinar, but, you know, Technology has a role to play in there, right? Um, I, you know, I love technology. I've been a technologist for probably all my life, even though I didn't always know it. But, you know, I, even I'm not going to say that technology should be the first thing that you, uh, that you know, you can't just go out and buy a product to be, you know, compliant with one regulation or another. You know, the, the, the processes need to be in place. The people need to be educated and so on. But at some point, you know, technology is going to have a role to play. You know, at some point, we are going to have to put technical controls in place you know, and the way the way that you are going to handle that, you know, is going to be dictated by what kind of data it is um, and who's supposed to have access to it. And it's also going to be dictated by what technical capabilities do we have? You know, I've talked to a lot of higher education institutions uh, about building research enclaves in the cloud for the simple reason that it's very, very difficult on an on-premises environment to effectively segregate that data. You know, many higher educations until not too long ago, you could walk into any building with a laptop in your hand, with a network cable in your hand, sit down in some public space, find the network port and plug in. Now, that's changing a little bit. You know, I, I certainly know the institution where I was has been making changes to kind of prevent that from happening. But it's not been that long that that was absolutely possible to just do that unauthenticated walk into an open building because, you know, classroom building, everything is open. You sit down, plug in a cable, you know, that makes it very hard you know, to build an enclave. Um, and so we've seen customers, you know, coming to us with requests for how can we effectively build uh, an environment that is segregated from the rest, uh, where we have all the necessary auditing in place and so on. Yeah, definitely. So um, Melissa, that's, yeah, I mean, that sounds like where there are some needs for some of those silos, even though you've built, you've, you've broken them down at the uh, executive level, the strategic level, you still need some silos build up, right? When you, when it comes to different levels of classification of data. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that's where, um, so da data silos and then uh, silos of just uh, institutional cultures and where people are, are have been at. Um, IT has always been viewed as kind of a service uh, provider on campus. And I think that uh, because of some of these new regulations and following the data and making sure that um, they're seen as a trusted advisor, I think IT is moving to a collaborator um, throughout the process. They're, they're, they're a strategic advisor throughout a grant process, um, even before the grant gets submitted to make sure that they do have all of those securities in place that they can sign off on it. Um, I think that we're seeing more of that, which is really uh, inspiring for me because it is changing the culture of higher education and and even the culture of IT. It's it's bringing them into the fold of the institution. It's not you know here's our digital initiatives and here's our institutional initiatives. It's our digital initiatives are our institutional initiatives and breaking that down so everybody kind of comes together. So while there are those silos of data, um, kind of thinking about the people all around it, um, them coming together is uh, is a really great thing that's, you know, happening throughout all of this. Yeah, uh, you know, I, th I think Melissa made a great point there, you know, the silos are, are organizational, not, not just around the data, but, you know, even Kevin, even talking about data silos, um, you know, it sounds like a bit of a contradiction, right? But at the same time, you know, I think that the fact that, for example, the Department of Defense is saying we need partners in the academic space to help us conduct research, to help us evaluate solutions is actually breaking down a silo. But but it doesn't mean that, you know, the data is just openly accessible to anyone, right? We're, we're breaking down silos around the data where, 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 you know, research institutions can do valuable um, activities with government data but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be protected, right? And I think that's where where some of the some of the challenges come in sometimes, right? Uh, Want to share data, but we have to keep control over it. Yeah, we built a uh, 800-171 compliant enclave specifically for that CUI data from our Department of Defense, Department of Energy uh, projects that we're working on, and and it's it is a silo, like Melissa was saying, but it's a silo for a reason. It's not because somebody. Yeah you know, protecting it or they're, you know, this is my job security or whatever. It's because 
the control. And, and it's hard because you, you have to make that compliance, but you want to do it in a way where the researcher has the least impact on their ability to do mm -hmm. their job, but it's still compliant. And, and I had someone ask, why don't we just do that enclave across everything? And I'm like, well, because we couldn't get any work done. I mean, it's it's too hard. It's too painful. And um, not to mention they they you know they kill me for for suggesting something like that. But but, it, but it's you know you have to be compliant, but you don't want to do it in a way that well you have to be compliant, but you want to do it in a way that minimizes the negative impact of that researcher. And and our sponsored research, the lady who leads up our sponsored research compliance, she reached out to IT and said, hey, we need to we need to build this. We're seeing who we mentioned in our contracts and we have to start doing this. So, so we, we built that enclave and it, and it's uh, mostly in the cloud um, for the reasons Sven mentioned. So. Yeah. So uh, I knew that the, uh, the toughest part of my job this afternoon would be to end the conversation. I mean, there, there's so many different aspects of protecting data and, and the strategies around there. But uh, with the time that we have left, I thought with the panels, I, I just kind of ask a final question of, of, of each of you. You saw the you know, the original poll question and people in various uh, parts of, of their journey when it comes to the, this protection. If each of you could give us one piece of advice, so no matter where you are on that path, of what would be the number one priority in your opinion for, for someone who is on the call today of what, you know, once they get off the webinar here and what they need to check uh, before they go home, or maybe once they get home, they can they can log in remotely and check on what's, what's uh, on what that priority should be. Maybe Sven, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I, I think the, the big thing, right, as we saw from the poll results is you, you have to take a step, you have to start uh, somewhere. And what that first step, in, in in my opinion, can be, and, and I'm going to try and say something different than I think David is going to say, right? Otherwise, we're just parroting each other. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think what uh, what you're going to um, have to start with um, is, is to build that team that is going to drive the initiative that is going to have credibility, you know, to put some of these controls in place and that is empowered to take some of these actions. That is, I think, you know, it's even possible that some of the report responses that we've seen that answered the second option, right? Where, hey, we, we know where our data is and we're making a plan and things like that. You know, is that team really in place that is going to have that credibility institution-wide? You know, when, when that team comes out with a governance policy about how we're going to manage data, how we are going to uh, you know, anything from classification to protection and, and, and even destruction in the end, right, that that is going to be credible. So it's going to require buy-in from a wide group of people, especially in a higher education institution. That's that's what I'll say. All right, David, well, I'll throw it on you then. So uh, so uh, Sven didn't steal your thunder. Well, so he abbreviated it greatly. And so it is start someplace. But then look at where your data is and keep modifying your plan. Because no plan should just be written up this year by your team or by the consultancies that come in there. But it's a plan that's written. It can be shared. It can be seen. But then modify it and look at it very frequently, many times through the years, not just when you're doing the uh, final budget submission before uh, the uh, beginning of the fiscal year there. Yeah. Good advice. Uh, Melissa, I'll throw that one on, uh, on to you as well. Uh, well, I always say you don't know what you don't know. Uh, and in this, uh, you know, you don't know what the maybe the next step is. Um, and I think uh, to Bill's earlier point of you don't want to bear your soul <laughs> uh, and show everything that you got, but you got to have conversations, I think, with um, your peers that are on, at different levels. Uh, you have to find somebody that maybe is ahead of you in the next step and behind you and around you. Have conversations, talk to people outside of your institution um, and, and even some of the vendors that you work with. I, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know with Microsoft. And there's a ton of resources at Microsoft to help people, um, not just in education, but uh, resources that they can leverage today. And I think that that, you know, just trusting one another in this, uh, that we're all in this together, not just at our individual institutions, but, um, 
you know, as technology is changing, as the world is changing in regulations, it's, you know, how can we all come together uh, to move uh, forward in defending our data? Uh, it's gonna, it's a team effort inside and outside of the institution. Fantastic, thanks, Melissa. And Bill, we'll leave you with the, uh, with the final word. Well, I, I mean, I mean, I think obviously with data, you, you want to start with your inventory, right? Is is where's your data? What is it? What are what's the requirements for it? But take a risk based approach. I mean, start with your most critical data first, and and like David said, you got to review it on a on a regular basis. I mean, you know, one of the things in our risk register is that our data center, which is I'm pointing over here, not that you can see it, but it's across the street. You know, we're two miles from the airport, and so is there a risk of an airplane crashing into the building and taking out? Yeah, likelihood's very low. I mean. The impact would be high, but we have to review that on a regular basis. One of my team members, he went and got his pilot's license, bought an airplane and got a hangar at the airport. I'm like, well, I got Jack flying all over the place now. Our risk has gone up. So we have to evaluate that, right? <laughs> um, the Jack so, you know, yeah. Take a risk-based approach, inventory your data, deal with the, the biggest things first um, that, that are risk to your organization. Um, that's, that's, that's the way we handle things, so. Well, once more, some some great advice from from the panel here. I see that our time is just about up, so I'm going to wrap things up here. Uh, be sure to check out some of these slides that we'll be scrolling through with some more uh, information, ways in which you can contact our panelists to to follow up. They have graciously afforded their their contact information there. If you have any particular questions that you want to ask for them, I'd like to thank the panel today for a very informative presentation. And would like to thank all the audience members for for joining as well. You can see in this slide we have some more uh, resources of information that you can download to help you on that on that journey too. And once again, as a reminder, you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to this recording, along with these slides. So don't worry about taking notes. But uh, once again, panel, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. It was really uh, an inspirational and informative conversation. Uh, thanks again for participating, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. Th thanks all. Bye, everyone.